Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Do the police need a warrant to enter your home once you have been identified as a person of interest? The head of the JCF's Corporate Communications Unit responds. Suing the state, St. Anne Man taking legal action against detention by cops. I'm Anthony Lugg. Here are the details. Head of the Jamaica Constabulary Communications Unit Senior Superintendent Stephanie Lindsay is this afternoon insisting that the police do not need a warrant to enter the home of someone deemed a person of interest. The comments come in the wake of questions regarding the controversial arrest of a St. Anne man on Tuesday. Cody and Barrett has more. The Jamaica Constabulary Force is at the center of a firestorm following the controversial arrest of a St. Anne man on Tuesday. This video shows Shaquille Higgins hurling insult at the Prime Minister. He was later picked up by the police. Higgins was told by cops to apologize to Mr. Holness, which he did on video, which was also widely circulated. The question now arising from the matter is why he was asked to issue an apology to the Prime Minister on video. And that is the part of it that um, we would like to know. That's part of what um, the commissioners asked I probe to look at because um, it's not part of our job function to do that. As a matter of fact, the army right is already said the army is unacceptable. Another element of controversy is that the police entered his house without a warrant. Head of the Jamaica Constabulary Communications Unit, Senior Superintendent Stephanie Lindsay, remains adamant that the lawmen were within legal standings. They don't need a warrant to enter an, a, someone's house? Because they're not going there to search. If you were going there to search, you would need a warrant of arrest to go in, to, to, or a search warrant to go in and search his premises. But if it's just to go in there to pick up somebody, you don't necessarily need a warrant. But attorney at law Isaac Buchanan argues that the police did not follow legal procedures in how the matter was handled. If the person is fleeing, and they have to, certainly if they're fleeing and in there in pursuit, then there's a situation where they have identified the suspect, the suspect is um, invading arrest, and then that's a part of the course of apprehending the individual. But that's not the case in this situation. Cody Ann Barrett, TVJ News. And the man who was arrested by the police after hurling insults at the Prime Minister is taking legal action against the state for his detention. This was confirmed by his attorney, Charles Ganga Singh. Mr. Ganga Singh says the process to initiate legal action has begun and a claim will be filed very soon. He explained that the action will be in relation to his client's detention, the entry of the police into his house, and issues relating to his privacy. The police issued a statement earlier this week saying that the man was a suspect in a case of larceny. After a question and answer session yesterday, the man was released by the St. Anne police. The age-old debate about the removal of the Queen as Jamaica's head of state is gaining renewed focus this afternoon. At least one social historian is arguing that more public education is needed so that Jamaicans understand the role of the royal family in slavery. This comes on the heels of comments from the Barbadian Prime Minister that the country will sever ties with the British monarchy later this year. Sandy Williams has been following the issue and now joins us live. Sandy? Thank you, Anthony. It's a plan the Barbados government first announced last year, September, during the opening of a new session of Parliament. This has reignited debate locally. Is Jamaica skirting around the issue of removing the Queen as head of state? Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley insisting that the country is still on track to become a parliamentary republic by November this year, the 55th anniversary of independence from Britain. That on the 30th of November of this year, our great nation which we love shall become a parliamentary republic. Secondly, that the cabinet has accepted the recommendations of the Ford Commission with minor modification. That our parliamentary republic shall have a non-executive president that shall be elected by an electoral college of both houses of parliament and that that president shall be entitled to serve initially for a period of four years and thereafter can be reappointed for another term. The latest comment from the Barbados Prime Minister has revived calls for Jamaica to follow suit. Social historian at the University of the West Indies, Mona, 
Professor Vereen Shepherd does not believe that Jamaica's education system has prepared the population sufficiently to understand the role of the British royal family in African enslavement. I'm not sure the level of education about the monarchy and the royal family is as it should be in Jamaica. A lot of people see the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II, as a nice old lady, and they feel, you know, she hasn't done anything to Jamaica. But that's because of lack of knowledge of how the royal family benefited from slavery and colonialism and how there has been an intergenerational transmission of wealth across, you know, not just the royal family but others in the UK. Therefore, she says public education is needed before Jamaica can take the step to remove the Queen as head of state. There should be public education on all the relevant issues. There should be public education about what the association with the royal family has done to Jamaica historically. From the time of conquest, their support of the traders and enslaved people, from their benefit of the wealth of the Caribbean, there should be education on that. This would mean that the Ministry of Education will have to take history education seriously and ensure that it's mandatory in all our schools. Barbados would not be the first former British colony in the Caribbean to become a republic, as Guyana became a republic in 1970, less than four years after gaining independence from Britain. Trinidad and Tobago followed suit in 1976 and Dominica in 1978. In April 2016, as he delivered the throne speech outlining the government's legislative agenda for 2016-2017, Governor General Sir Patrick Allen said the Andrew Holness administration would introduce a bill to remove the Queen as head of state. It's something the People's National Party administration also promised to do in 2011. In March this year, opposition MP Mikhail Phillips tabled a motion in Parliament for the removal of the Queen as head of state and Jamaica to become a republic. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. To some health-related news now, renewed calls this afternoon for Jamaicans to obey the COVID-19 protocols. That call comes from the president of the Montego Chamber of Commerce, Montego Chamber of Commerce, Janet Silvera, days after the Prime Minister announced new restrictions. O'Shane Masters has more. Why is it so difficult for us to adhere to the protocols? That's what we need to ask ourselves as a country, as a people. That question from president of the Montego Bay Chamber of Commerce, Janet Silvera. Prime Minister Andrew Honus revised the curfew orders on Monday following a spike in positive cases and also an uptick in the reproductive rate of the virus. But some have raised concerns, saying the new curfew orders will impact the entertainment sector and other businesses negatively. In defending the government's position, the chamber president said the decisions taken must have been based on well-researched data by the relevant technocrats. They know whether or not we should be in groups or we should not be in groups. So I'm thinking that at this time, the only thing that we could do as the business community is to support the government at this time. And at the same time, call on the public to add. Yes, we have to call on the public to adhere to the, the protocols. The protocols work. We have seen that the protocols work. It's not as if we're not aware that the protocols work. They work. She says from a business standpoint, there can be no disagreement with the revised measures. Clinical coordinator at the Cornwall Regional Hospital, Dr. Delroy Frey, says if there is to be any return to normality, Jamaicans must take the vaccine. If the vaccine is available and you don't take the vaccine, it really borders on suicide. And that is my personal feeling. This is not the feeling of the ministry or anyone. This is Dr. Frey's personal feeling. I think the way we are going to capture this thing and, and, and control it, in the meantime, there has been a slight uptick in COVID-positive cases at the Taipei Health Facility. As at July 27, there were 19 positive cases and 10 suspected cases at the Cornwall Regional Hospital. But measures are being put in place in the event of a further increase. We do anticipate it, especially with the opening up of areas abroad, and specifically I'd like to mention the United States. And with the 
opening of our borders, although there has been some restriction, we do anticipate that we will have patients with the Delta variant and therefore ex expect an increase in our numbers. Shane Masters, TVJ News. Meanwhile, 182 new COVID-19 cases were recorded in the last 24 hours from 1,905 tests. The country's case count now stands at 52,504. This brings the positivity rate to 19.1%. The death toll remains at 1,182. Meanwhile, 142 people have been hospitalized with the virus. 24 are critically ill and 33 moderately ill. There are 4,025 active cases. And it's time now for a break, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to Midday News. Thanks for staying with us. The Caribbean and Latin America face an avalanche of worsening health issues if COVID-19 disruption of health services continues. That's the latest warning from the Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO. Shamela Pullen reports. COVID-19 continues to have a devastating toll on the region, with some countries, including neighboring Cuba, reporting the world's highest weekly death rates. That's according to Director of the Pan-American Health Organization, Dr. Carissa Etienne. Cuba is experiencing higher COVID infection and death rates than at any point in the pandemic, and all age groups are affected. In the last week, more than 7,000 minors and nearly 400 pregnant women have tested positive for COVID-19. But as countries in Latin America and the Caribbean dedicate resources, staff and attention to the pandemic, many have been finding it difficult to keep up with other essential health services that people need. In a recent survey of health services in the region, 97% of participating countries and territories reported disruptions. 45% reported disruptions in at least half of their health services. These disruptions are having an inordinate impact on our first level of care. The PAHO director advised countries to hire and train additional staff so that all healthcare workers have the tools and resources to safely provide care. Equally important is ensuring that healthcare workers are fairly compensated for their extraordinary efforts. Chile, for example, recently approved a pay bump to providers who have been so critical to the COVID-19 response. We know that the economic blowback of this pandemic is forcing countries to make difficult choices on where to prioritize spending. But we cannot afford to cut corners on health. Because make no mistake, sooner or later, countries will assume the costs. Shimela Pullen, TVJ News. Frustration boiled over in roads Pen Clarendon Wednesday over a long-standing electricity, electricity issue in the community. Residents say they're tired of waiting and want the service now. Dwayne Anderson reports. A small group of residents protesting over what is a big problem in the Roadspen community in Clarendon. The community has no electricity. Andrew Wallace, please, we beg you. We beg you, please, we need this. We need it. We can't wait for two years. We say we're going to get local light. We need it like no. We beg you, every man, we, we, we pay them bill. We're willing to pay the bill. We're willing. We cannot live on in a darkness. We have some younger kids here, they're going to school. They can't do nothing. They can't do nothing for their phone. They can't do nothing for their tablet. Right now, because of the it's current, what we not have, we look at Sunday down my hospital because of asthma. We can't sleep in a darkness. The place is getting so hot. Corona gone. And we can't live in a darkness. The people added that the community has its challenges with criminality. Therefore, to be without electricity, especially at nights, is unsafe. Thief is coming now and block people's house and rape off people. Because we have no light on you. We were told the community is one of those slated for electrification under the state led rural electricity program, and this was communicated to the residents during a meeting two weeks ago. 
However, no set timeline was given for when this program would start to benefit residents. The Minister Davis spoke to them, told them what we'll be doing and what he will be doing. So the process has started for us to extend the electricity into the rest of the areas of that community that do not have electricity. And so I was shocked when I heard that these residents were demonstrating today. Dwayne Anderson, TVJ News. The Minister of National Security, Dr. Horace Chang, has admitted that homicides could continue to climb, especially as gangsters continue to turn on each other. He was asked on Wednesday to address the crime situation in the country where murders in particular are spiraling out of control. The latest figures indicate that 815 murders were recorded up to July 27. It represents an increase of more than 6% over the same period last year. I expect until we have full impact of the, all the programs we are putting in the police, the full numbers and facilities, and you will get the You'll get a band because as gangs operate, they will still kill each other from time to time, but you'll get it on a more steady downward trend. But until then, there will be a, a band of up and down with 4 or 5 percent. It's now time for the Business Minute. Here's Cody and Barry. In the world of business, Kingston Wharves Limited will be investing 55 million U.S. dollars over the course of the next four years on capital investments. According to the CEO, Mark Williams, reconstruction of its birthing facility, which is expected to start by the end of this year, is among some of the improvements the company will be undertaking. We also intend to do a logistics facility uh, on 12 acres of property that we have um, to expand into nearshoring opportunity, which is a real opportunity arising from COVID that we can have a conversation about. And we've already booked a new super post Panamax screen. We've made that deposit and we do expect a delivery in uh, Q4. He was speaking during Mayberry's Investor Forum on Wednesday. And in business internationally, the U.S. economy is growing a bit. In the second quarter, it grew at an annual rate of 6.5%. That's the fastest pace since last fall, but still slower than analysts expected. The recovery was spurred by an increase in consumer spending and continued vaccination efforts, which allowed Americans to take part in public life safely again. But economists say momentum slowed down because of inflation. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Cody Ann Barrett. Now for the top regional and international stories, here's O'Shane Masters. 186,690 citizens have been fully vaccinated in the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This represents 98.8% of the country's goal in having 188,900 persons fully vaccinated by July 31. It comes as Trinidad and Tobago pushes to attain herd immunity against COVID-19. In the meantime, Health Minister Terence Dale Singh says on Saturday, a new vaccination plan will be put in place. However, while noting the uptake in vaccines, the positivity rate continues to trend upwards. Currently, the positivity rate in the Twin Island Republic is at 33%. Further overseas, a new report shows homicide rates have increased in nearly two dozen American cities. The Council on Criminal Justice published the report. The think tank looked at the number of murders reported during the first six months of this year. It found the murder rate in 22 cities increased by 16% compared to last year. Gun assaults were also up by 5% and aggravated assaults rose by 9%. But drug and property crime actually fell. And that's it for your Midday Roundup. I'm Shane Masters. We head now to a quick break. When we return, we'll have your Midday Sports Report. Renata Brown is standing by. Welcome back to your Midday Sports. I'm Renata Brown. Now, Jamaican boxer Ricardo Big 12 Brown has been eliminated from the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games after going down on points to Indian Satish Kumar in the round of 16 of the men's super heavyweight division on Thursday. Brown fell 4-1 to Kumar, who now advances to the quarterfinals of the competition. Four of the five judges gave the edge to Kumar due to his quick and efficient combination of uppercuts and jabs. This is the first time since 1996 that Jamaica was having a representative in the sport of boxing at the Olympic Games. 
18 Jamaicans will be involved on the opening day of track and field action at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games this evening, Jamaica time. Travis Michael will be the first Jamaican to be in the spotlight as he competes in the men's discus throw qualification, Group A, at 7.45. At 8.33, Pan American Games champion Atoya Gould Topin will compete in the heats of the women's 800 meters. Now at 9.20, World Championship silver medalist Fedric Dakers and at 2013 CAC Games gold medalist Chad Wright will compete in Group B of the men's discus. At 9.25, the trio of Kemar Maud, Jail Hyde and Sean Rowe will line up in the heats of the men's 400-meter hurdles. At 10.15, Shelly and Fraser Price, Sharika Jackson and Elaine thompson Hero will line up in the heats of the women's 100 meters. Triple jumper Shanika Ricketts and Kimberly, Kimberly Williams will compete at 5.05 a.m., while at 5.25, Daniel Thomas Dodd and Ladricia Cameron will go in the women's shot put qualification. The last Jamaican representation on the opening day of track and field will be in the heat of the mixed 4x400 meter relay at 6.12 a.m. The defending champions Mexico will face Canada in the semifinals of the CONCACAF Gold Cup this evening in Houston. Canada booked their place in the last four by beating Costa Rica 2-0 while Mexico got the better of Honduras 3-0. Jamaican Danian Parchment will be the referee for the contest with fellow Jamaicans Jasset Carr and O'Shea Nation as assistant and fourth official respectively. Kickoff is at 9 o'clock Jamaica time. And after eliminating the Reggae Boys at the quarterfinal stage, the United States will take on invited team Qatar in the first semifinal at 6.30, the final is slated for Sunday. Novak Djokovic remains on course for a golden slam after ruthlessly ending the dreams of home hopeful Ki Nishikori to cruise into the Olympic semifinals. The world number one bidding to become the first man to win all four Grand Slam titles and an Olympic gold medal in the same year breezed through 6-2-6 love. He will face Germany's Alexander Zverev in the semifinals on Friday. Switzerland's Belinda Bensic and Czech Republic's Marketa Vanjasova, who eliminated Naomi Osaka in the third round, will meet in Saturday's women's final. And that's it for your Midday Sports Report. It's back to you, Anthony. Thank you, Renardo. And that's the Midday News. I'm Anthony Lugg. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.